I love that song, by the way. And I found out how many people don't know it, and I feel like we've done a major disservice, especially for Gen Z who doesn't know 80s music. So I think part of um, Heaven on Earth is, uh, is learning all those power 80s ballads that really shape us. <laughs> Amen. Um, and I do love that song so much. Um, also, I love that song because I think Belinda Carlisle has like a better understanding of theology than a lot of Christians, you know? She's like, yes, did you know heaven is a place on earth? And in, the, in heaven, love comes first. Yeah, amen. So I am passionate about this series that we've been in, talking about heaven on earth. And, and I, I, I know I, every time I get up here, I feel like I'm like, I love this thing. I'm passionate about this. You know, I just, I am that way a little bit. You know, I, I, yeah, I love things easily and quickly. And, and yeah, it's strange. Um, but this in particular feels so sweet talking about heaven on earth. It was a shift in my paradigm and my thinking about God in this place, um, thinking about the idea of heaven on earth that actually made me start following Jesus as an adult. So I grew up in the church. Many of you know some of my story, but you know, I was just like over it. I grew up fundamentalist and like really just learning lots of laws and rules and regulations and worrying about if I was going to go to heaven. And, and as a, as a um, child who has like a del- delighted, rebellious spirit, you know, um, feeling like that's an impossibility for me. I will never measure up, you know. I will never follow the rules the way or, or um, make things happen the way uh, folks around me are. This is not a good situation for me. <laughs> um, but as an adult and growing up and learning having a paradigm shift about who Jesus really is and what he invites us to just changed me. And now I'm not asking, you know, how do I get to heaven when I die? How will I measure up? I'm asking, like, how am I being transformed by Jesus? And how do I live out the ways of Jesus in my own life, in my own neighborhood, in my job, in my work, in my family? And I love that. I love that invitation. Jesus told us that in the, in the way that he taught his disciples to pray, praying the, the Lord's Prayer. He said, pray for my kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. Pray for that. And I, I'm compelled by that invitation. I am not compelled by, you know, working hard enough to get somewhere or managing my own behaviors, but I am compelled by seeing heaven come to earth, aren't you? Amen. And that's what Jesus invites us to. And so that's where I want to talk from this morning. And I'm so excited to talk about this. Even this week, as I was preparing and wrestling with some of these things, I'm like, oh, I'm speaking to myself. There's ways that I desperately need to be challenged in this and need to hear this again and again. What does it look like for me to live out the values of the kingdom? What does it look like for me to follow Jesus, living out heaven on earth? And not just talking about it, but living it out. Because the kingdom of God was never just meant to be theologized or intellected or preached about or studied about or read about. We love to do that, don't we? But it's a whole way of being. It's a whole way of, of living your life with the values of heaven on earth. And I think about even how the earliest disciples of Jesus, they called themselves followers of the way. They were followers of Jesus, but they were followers of the way. They were following the way Jesus lived. They loved Jesus. They were compelled by him. They believed that he was their teacher, and they did what he did. They did what they saw him doing. They were following a way of Jesus. And the same thing is true for us today. We are followers of the way, but I feel like so often it doesn't look that way. In fact, when I think about Christians, myself included, when I'm like, oh, this person is a Christian, or this person is not a Christian, or whatever, often it's based on what they believe. I think so often we think about Christianity as a set of beliefs 
And even, it can even be a set of values, but it's not just that. It is following the way of Jesus. It's not about what you do believe or don't believe or whatever. Those things inform how you live, but it is about the way, following the way of Jesus. There's a, an author I really love um, named Mark Scandrett, and he, uh, all of his books are, are um, you read a little bit and then you practice something. You, you like apply it. So he'll give you the practice of like rest or he'll give you the practice of like talking to a stranger just to get to know somebody in your neighborhood, you know? And then um, and it's all about kind of living this out. And he says, Jesus didn't communicate information or ideas, but he declared, I am the way. And he invited his disciples into a new way of life. As a rabbi, he taught his disciples by inviting them to make dramatic changes in their lives, to risk new ways of being and doing. There is a a way that we embody our faith. It's not just beliefs, but it's a posture. How How do we lean into life? How do we engage with the things that Jesus taught us? So how do we do that? How do we follow this new way of being and doing, or what, are the, what, what is the way of Jesus? So what comes to your mind when you think of the way of Jesus? Maybe what's the first kind of value or characteristic that you think of when you think of the way of Jesus? Some love. kindness, love. Yes, love. You know I was gonna say love, right? <laughs> love is, is the kind of overarching value in the kingdom of God. The way of Jesus is love. And every value, every uh, belief that we have, every way that we live in the kingdom of God could be summed up in this, love. And there's so many passages, even I'm gonna just rattle off so many passages this morning to you, but I want us to be reminded, and these things are gonna feel really simple. You're like, duh, yes, I already know that Jesus is about love. But we need to be reminded because we don't live it out often, do we? Or maybe I'm speaking for myself. But there were, I love the passage where um, there's a crowd and there's Pharisees and disciples all mixed together and they're talking to Jesus and they say, one of them says, teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And he replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul and your mind. That's the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and prophets hang on these two commandments. Everything hangs on love. I mean, and, and, these guys would have been hearing it as like literally everything they understood as the law, everything they understood in the Old Testament. All of that hangs on this idea of love. Everything is wrapped up in love. Can, do you think that's an accurate depiction of Christianity in our world today? That people are like, oh, the first thought that comes to my mind is people whose whole lives are wrapped up in love. Isn't that sad? I don't know about you, maybe you're thinking about, I, I think of some of you and I think of that, but as a whole, the, the kind of idea, reputation of Christianity is not people who are wrapped up in love, but God himself is love. So of course our foundation is love. First John talks about this, he says, John says, dear friends, let us love one another. Love comes from God. Everyone who's been born of God, everyone who loves, has been born of God and knows God. Whoever doesn't love doesn't know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. And then we see the ultimate picture of sacrifice, of unconditional love. He sent his one and only son in the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us. So he loves us first and our love is a response to him. And he loved us and he sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. I love that. No one's ever seen God, but actually as we love each other, we see God. We have a picture, an image, a view of what God looks like, of what the way of Jesus looks like. And if you think about some of the most famous words, probably in the world, not just in Christianity, on love are Paul's words from 1 Corinthians, and these are read all the time at weddings, and it's not even really about romantic love even a little bit, you know? It's great. I mean, you really absolutely should apply those things to your marriage. Um, 
But that's not at all what it's about. In fact, Paul is talking to some early Christians. He's talking to the church at Corinth and he's saying to them, you guys have gotten it, you're getting it wrong already. Like you're starting to focus so much on being heard and having a platform and you're so focused on having your message heard and letting everyone know that you have the right, the, the truth that you've forgotten to love people. And so he says to them, If I speak in tongues of men or angels, but I don't have love, I'm only a resounding gog or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy, but I can't fathom mysteries and knowledge, if I have faith that can move mountains, but I don't have love, I'm nothing. Like if I have all this knowledge and all the right things and the right ideas, the right theology, but I'm not loving people, then it doesn't matter. And then even on the other end, we've talked a lot about this, the like right theology and then the, also the theology of just doing a lot. But even then, if I give all I possess to the poor and I give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but don't have love, I gain nothing. If you're giving in order to look good, if you're giving in order to get something, it's not love. Love is patient, love is kind, it doesn't envy, it doesn't boast, it's not proud, it doesn't dishonor others, it's not self-seeking, it's not easily... Anger, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love doesn't delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It protects, it trusts, it hopes, it perseveres. And at the end of that whole um, talk on love to this church, he says, there are three things that remain. Faith, hope, and love. Which one do you think is the greatest? Love. I think though if I was gonna answer in my theological brain, I'd be like, faith, faith. No, he says the greatest of these is love. And when we think about love, it's not, I know you've, again, this is all so simple, but I want to remind you this morning, love is not just this, you know, mushy feeling, although I love that feeling, um, but it is a verb, it's an action, right? It's a, it, there's a, a way that love moves us into action, and that would be called compassion, when Keegan was talking about um, leading students in the justice program, we studied uh, the, Good Samar- the parable of the Good Samaritan together. And students were really struck by the the part where it talks about compassion. And so we looked that up. And in in Greek, that word compassion, and then it's all through the New Testament. There's so many moments where Jesus has compassion on someone, or it says he was moved with compassion, so he did something different than what he was originally going to do. Or he cared for people, and he, he continually did things based on this compassion that he experienced. Do you know what it means in the Greek? It means many bowled one. Isn't that funny? Like your bowels. And it's this idea that compassion comes from your gut. It's like a, it's a gut feeling. Like I am, it it disturbs me. You know, I can feel that. When was the last time that you felt gut level, like compassion for somebody? Yeah, bless you, Megan. (laughs) That's probably not everybody's experience that gut feeling of compassion that leads you to do something. There's a dear woman in our church, and I'm gonna tell her story, but I won't use her name because she would, she's a very humble person. She wouldn't wanna be known for this, but this friend of mine was explaining a story to me a while back about how she works, um, she works at a clinic and she works with people who have kind of chronic pain. And um, so she deals with people who are always experiencing you know, tough times, and they're desperate. And so she works at the front desk, so she sees a lot of people and the stuff they're going through. She deals with some of the billing stuff, and she's on the phone one day with a a husband, and, and he's an elderly man, and he's crying because he's telling her, we can't come in for our next appointment because we can't afford it. We already have all this debt from this pain clinic, and we can't afford our next treatment, but my wife is so miserable, and this is so, it's so imperative that she has this treatment, and so he's crying, he's like, is there a way that we can work around this, you know? And she was just like, no, this is, there at some point there is a way you have to begin payments and you haven't paid, and um, and so they have this whole conversation, and she says, well, let me think about it, you know, and she hangs up with him, and she talked about, the feeling that she felt, and I'm like, oh, it was, that compa- it was that gut level compassion, that love for this man that she doesn't even know, but she can hear his suffering, she can hear his struggle. And so then 
she's explaining that to me and she's like, that, that felt like God. Do you think that was God in that moment? I'm like, totally, you know, that's Jesus in you. That's you following the way of Jesus. And so she was gonna end the story there. Um, and I said, so what happened? She's like, well, we figured out a way and I was able to call him back and um, let him know. And she's like, he just wept with the good news that he was, his wife, he was able to bring his wife in for treatment. And I said, so what, like, do you have a program for that or something? And she was like, well, we figured something out. I was like, what happened? I pushed her a little more. You know what she did? She wrote a check herself. Can you imagine that? I said, excuse me? Well, that is a, that is a next level compassion. You deal with folks like this all the time. She was like, something hit me and it doesn't happen every time. I can always be empathetic, but there was something in my gut that was deep. It was that level of love and compassion for these folks that I knew I had to do something. She's like, they have no idea. I told them that it was, you know, there was a, a system, an, an error in the system and I was able to figure it out and they were able to get their treatment. The way of Jesus is love that moves us to action. The way of Jesus is hospitality. I love this one too. The, the whole way of Jesus is hospitable. This is not like Jesus invited over, people over to his home and his home was cute and you know decorated in modern times, like whatever. Jesus didn't even have a home to invite people to. Instead, he went to other people's homes. It's just Jesus embodied hospitality in who he was. It's not, it wasn't a, a way of like setting out a nice meal for someone. It was who he was as a person, who he is as God. He is a hospitable God. The way of Jesus invites us to be a hospitable people. I thought immediately of the story of, of Jesus eating with Levi and other tax collectors. There's so many of these stories in the gospels of Jesus going and having dinner with the wrong people. It says, well, Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house. Many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples. There were many who followed him. And then when the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with sinners and tax collectors, they asked, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And on hearing this, Jesus said to them, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Jesus is hospitable and he loves all folks. And he eats with them. I love this story over and over. We did a whole series on dinners with Jesus because Jesus eats with people. And what does that mean? It doesn't mean what it means in our context today. We have dinner with strangers sometimes, you know? We have dinner with a new friend. In the time that Jesus was living, food meant you were family with these people. Food meant that you associated yourself deeply with them. To share a meal was a very intimate act. And he was intimately connecting with these people who are tax collectors, who are hated in society at that time. That's Jesus. He's hospitable to all people, the people who we wouldn't be hospitable to. He is, he always makes room. I love this song this morning we sing. I love that song. I'll make room for you. And Jesus is like, uh, we say, we're gonna make room for you in our lives, Jesus. And he's like, yes, thank you. I, am a, I make room for people. I make room, I am a hospitable God. I think about the great, the, you know, the parable of the great banquet. He goes out and uh, it, the, it says that the, the, the host of the banquet invited all these folks and many of them said no and he was mad. He was like, no, I want my house full, I want my table full. And so he sent his servants out and he said, go and go to the, go to the places where you, you would not normally go. You know, this is not for just like a religious elites. Like, Go to the country lanes, go to the alleyways. I don't care who it is, bring them in. I want them to feast with me at the banquet. There is a, a hospitality in the way of Jesus. And it is so countercultural, isn't it? Especially, and we, we've mentioned this at different times, but we all feel that in some ways. In a society, especially now, where we're just dividing, it's like, you believe this? Okay, I find you. You know, there's such a, you find your tribe, you find your people, and I'm guilty of it. But Jesus is like, no, no, no. Like, I want to bring, I, I, I am a hospitable God. Following me means that you will be hospitable. You will mix and mingle with people you never expected to mix and mingle with. The way of Jesus invites us to live that way. We, I had a 
a concert at our house a couple weeks ago. My brother had a friend who was in town and he shared some of his music and his story. And I just invited a whole bunch of people. And the concert was amazing. I mean, this guy is like a fabulous singer. Like he won The Voice. He was on Broadway. You know what my greatest delight that whole night was? Not him. My delight was all these different people in the house. And I'm like, you know what? This is part of the way, is, is the hospitality of the way. I, we, we had folks who were like Gen Z and boomers. You know, we had the grandparents and we had grandkids. We had little ones. We had white and black. We had gay and straight. I mean, we had, we had a whole room full of people. And these folks didn't necessarily have anything in common, but the space that night. And Jesus invites us to be a hospitable people, The way of Jesus is hospitality, to love and care for people of all walks of life. And the way of Jesus is generosity. We get to be generous. Jesus was always inviting people to be generous. And that's, it's similar to hospitality. It's it's, uh, opening your heart, opening your life, opening your resources to other folks. I saw... um, a story this week in scripture, and I'd never seen these words of Jesus, but Jesus said to the crowds, be on guard around greed. Life doesn't exist around an abundance of possessions. Wow. And that's when he's telling the crowds this parable of a man who was a rich farmer, and he had um, a lot of grain. He had been Uh, He had been rich in his land and he was able to pull a lot of grain and he didn't have room for it in his barns. And so um, Jesus is explaining that this man's idea was to tear down his smaller barns and he was going to build bigger barns and so that he could fill those up. So, and then that's in the, I love that this is in scripture. It says, eat, drink, and be merry. (laughs) This this guy says, I'm going to fill my barns full so I have more than I need so that I can, he literally says, so I can eat, drink, and be merry, you know? And Jesus, you know, Jesus so sternly reacts to that. He says to him, you're a fool. And your life tonight, your life will be demanded of you. Like, you will die if that's the path that you choose. Do we believe that? That actually death comes when we store and hoard and life comes when we're generous and we give? For me even, it's like, I believe that in my brain, but I've got to learn to live that. I have to learn to, it's a lesson I have to continually remind myself of because my nature is to want to store. My nature is to want to, and I I feel like I'm a generally generous person, but there's something in me. Part of it is the culture around me is like, ah, I got to save, I got to store, I got to hoard, you know, I I need these things. And actually Jesus is inviting us to generosity. The way of Jesus is generosity. I love this quote, I couldn't find an author for it, but um, it says, when you have more than you need, build a longer table and not a higher fence. Like when you have what you, more than you need, generosity is our practice. Not guarding it and hoarding it. Jesus was so this way, he was so generous with his heart and his time and his resources. I think about my friend Christy, oh I shouldn't have said her name. She doesn't go to this church, it's fine. She won't watch this. <laughs> she has been, she's a dear friend of mine and um, was a, one of my roommates in college and one of my best friends. And she is a very generous human. And when I started working, like you can talk about with InterVarsity, we raise our budgets. And um, so when I started working for InterVarsity, I remember like going out and asking folks, hey, will you be a part of my ministry team? She was like one of the first people to say yes. And that was six, 17 years ago almost. And she's been supporting me monthly that long, up to today. And I think about the amount of money that she's given, invested into college students' lives, into lives like Keegan and Blessing and into my life. And I'm overwhelmed. And one of the things that she talked about was, this is a number of years ago, she met with a financial advisor to kind of get an idea of, you know, she was thinking about making some purchases and things. And the financial advisor looked through her documents and was like, okay, we first need to address you're giving like and he was just very honest he was like this is irresponsible like this is not actually going to get you to your goals like I think if you pulled back on some of your giving like we could get you to where you want to be faster 
And she told me about that and she was so offended. She was like, no. And she told him, no, that my, I, part of who I am, like Jesus invites me to be a generous person. I always will be. And you can't stop me. And it won't stop me from all the other things that God's inviting me to. Like I get blessed by being able to be generous. Isn't that amazing? And isn't that true in our world? Like us being generous is usually irresponsible in some ways, or it could be seen that way because it's responsible to save and to, to hold back and to you know, think very logically and reasonably about your finances. I know there are a number of you in this church who don't do that who are willing to, to hear from Jesus and to say, I, this doesn't make sense to me, but the Lord has asked me to give this. I've experienced that. Even Matthew, over the last nine months, Matthew hasn't had a job because he's been working all his practicum hours in order to become a mental health counselor. And so we've been living on one income and God has spoken to people. I'm like, people have generously dropped off meals, generously written checks and I, like, thank you. There's a way too that these things get lived out together in community because we continue to give too. You know, we decided we're not gonna stop giving to the places that we give to even in this, even in this season of having one income. We just feel a conviction about that. Now, that's Matthew. I would have been happy to stop giving to those things like, let's be safe, you know? Thankfully, we have one Christian in our family. <laughs> um, there's so much more to say, and I, yeah. The way of Jesus is humility. Jesus came, his whole life has been about humility. He came as a baby, he didn't have to do that. He came to earth as a baby.